our series, the Poultry Health Research Network Seminar Series is, uh, is uh, full house today, and it's, uh, it's um, a great pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Mo Deaver, but you know what, who really needs uh, introduction for Dr. Deaver, because he is quite well known to almost all of us. He's been, uh, I would say, one of the most renowned alumni of OVC. He graduated from OVC not that long ago. Um, <laughs> no pun intended. It was actually 1969 when he graduated. He practiced for a couple of years in large animal practice, and then uh, uh, subsequent to that, he started with poultry practice. And he's been in poultry practice for quite some time now, for, to be exact, for 47 years. Uh, Dr. Beaver is also uh, one of the co-founders of Poultry Industry Council, and for those of you who don't know what Poultry Industry Council is, uh, it's, it, I would say it really propelled research in the area of poultry in Ontario and perhaps across Canada. Uh, before uh, the Canadian Poultry Research Council came to exist, Poultry Industry Council was in fact one of the main driving forces of poultry research in, in Canada and particularly in Ontario, and it's still uh, going very strong, but partly focusing on education. Uh, Dr. Bieber has uh, served on Dean's Council of OBC, and he has mentored many, many, many students. I would say countless number of students. Uh, I would say undoubtedly Dr. Dr. Bieber is one of the most renowned poultry vets in Ontario, and perhaps across Canada. But what he is setting apart from the rest of the pack is the fact that he's recognized for his passion and his devotion to training and education of students and other highly qualified personnel who would be knocking on his door, asking for his experience, asking for his time and for his knowledge. And he's absolutely generous with his knowledge and with his time. And he's in fact an infinite source of knowledge. Anything related to poultry, health and poultry disease, he would come to Dr. Beaver. Like I said, he's probably one of the most renowned poultry vets in Canada. Or perhaps even the world, Dr. Beaver, just to put a little bit more onus on you. Um, I, I always say that Dr. Beaver ha does not have a no in his vocabulary, and he's extremely generous with his time and knowledge. And especially if you think of anyone else with this degree of devotion and passion for what he does and for the veterinary profession as a whole. So it is indeed my great honor to have Dr. Deeper here. He came here in 2016 to give uh, the PHRN seminar and here he is after a couple of years and he's going to be entertaining us with another very interesting seminar. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I feel very good because I see familiar faces and I see students. And I want to give you a little bit of a history, and I, I must say, uh, many years ago, Eugene Whalen, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, gave a meeting, and Conrad Van Dyke was at that meeting also, and Conrad is here, and it was in Toronto at the Royal York, and for some reason, he had the wrong speech. He, <laughs> he was talking about the dairy industry, and of course, he is the father of supply management in Canada. And so, let's go back. Um, uh, <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning. And so the beginning is, uh, I was born and raised on a, on a farm in Formosa, Ontario. And Formosa is the Latin word for beautiful. And even today, they're selling water. Uh, they drilled for oil there. They went down a thousand feet and they found water. And so there is a flowing well. And so that is now called raw water. But when I went to church in that, in that uh, community, uh, there was a veterinarian that sat behind us, and there was a dairy farmer that sat beside us. And every time, every, the odd Sunday when they went out, he would, the, the farmer would tap the veterinarian on the shoulder and say, I wonder, Doc, if you could come and look at the cow on your way home from church. <laughs> uh, of course, she hadn't been eating well for a few days. And of course, this, the insinuation was, but don't charge me for a farm visit. But... I went to high school in Walkerton, and of course, Walkerton came out with some very bad news came out of Walkerton. That was the uh, E. coli outbreak. Uh, eight people died. Uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people got ill. And I know the farm where that E. coli originated from, 
and that farm E. coli from the cattle uh, got into the well water in Walkerton, but the water was not chlorinated. The water was not chlorinated, and that was a serious problem. There was a serious uh, problem there. So let's talk about the farmer's perspective. What is our responsibility? Well, we're responsible for welfare, for consumer trust. And there's a lot of marketing coming out now where we have consumer trust in mind. As a farmer, we're also responsible for the environment. We don't want phosphorus runoff to pollute Lake Erie. We don't want the air coming out of our barn, which is methane, ammonia, and respiratable dust. To, to pollute the environment. And of course, as a farmer, there's a sweet spot. We want it to be economically viable, but we also want it to be profitable. And so when I think of this, um, I heard very recently that there is pressure uh, on, 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 on our fast food outlets to have a slow growing chicken. And of course, this idea is very common in Europe and in Ontario now, Fry's Hatchery supplies a dual purpose bird, but it's, an, it's for an alternative market. And so what happens is it takes 12 weeks to grow the bird that can normally be grown in five weeks. That is a problem for the amount of pollutants coming out of our barn, the amount of manure, the amount of water, the amount of feed. And so that's a negative, but that's what the consumer wants. Sustainability depends on your viewpoint. On the right hand side, what you're really looking at here, what you're looking at here is high density in Holland. You're talking, you're talking about uh, high density is uh, 40 kilos per square meter. That's a bird on a half a square foot. And so, what else are we looking at here? Well, we really want our birds to be organic. We want our birds to be outside. We want them to be able to go outside. It's very low density but it comes at a cost, it comes at a cost. Feed, better feed conversion, shorter days to market, less manure, less air pollution. The most climate friendly meats are pork and poultry. Of course, that's marketing. And uh, we know this gentleman, uh, he had a problem with listeria that got into the meats. And of course, he's very conscious of his image, but he, this, this, uh, this is, really what he's saying, that the, the genetics that we have today and how we're managing, we're doing, we're getting more out with less input. So think about terminology. Uh, I'm a chicken farmer. Oh, I'm a chicken producer. I'm a grain farmer. I'm a cash cropper. No, let's not use those terms. Uh, marketing boards, marketing boards are of less, we're chicken, turkey, and egg farmers, market, farmers, we, that's who we are. We're not marketing boards. We should have maybe years ago used the, the term enriched housing rather than enriched cages. Perception is reality. People will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did. But people will never forget how you make them feel. And so as a farmer, you better make them feel good. People trust farmers even if they don't trust farming. They also trust veterinarians but they trust farmers more than what they trust veterinarians. <laughs> Factory farm, this is all I hear, with about uh, three or four million birds on that farm. Okay, factory farm, that's a consumer concept. Well, that's the way the industry is going. That's a picture from Ohio. There's a lot of birds. Now, do you want to be uh, within 100 meters downwind from that farm? Maybe not. So there is a concept out there, uh, a new cage facility in Pennsylvania. I actually posted some birds from that farm from Pennsylvania, and I'll tell you how. There was some dead on arrival, spent fowl came to Canada, and if there's too many dead, they get posted. I, I do a post-mortem on them. And of course, so what's the concept? Well, rather than that large facility with 350,000 layers in, you know, our concept is free roaming aviary barns where the density is a lot lower and the birds can walk around and enjoy what they enjoy naturally. And so, but what's happening now? Towns, cities, Toronto. Uh, what we're looking at, oh, we can have chickens in town too. And so the concept is, uh, 
All right, so um, <laughs> the A and W guy, if uh, if he were uh, every broiler producer that I visit, they do not like the A and W guy because they imply that all the other chicken out there has antibiotics in it, but the A and W burgers do not. That's what they imply. And the only opinion I think it was Mark Twain that said. The only opinion that really matters is that of the consumer, and we need to have consumers' trust. What are our market choices? Ah, I went looking at the Sayers store very recently, and lo and behold, um, of course, antibiotic-free turkey, raised without antibiotics, uh, but there's some flamingo turkey from Quebec there, and it says there's no hormones. So, yeah, there's no hormones in there. Of course not. That was banned in the 1950s. But I don't know, they want to make uh, consumers very sure. So there's quite a bit of market choices out there. It's very dramatic. And so, ah, my daughter and her husband went to Brazil and they came back with biodynamica. They're saying they're raising birds, biodynamica. That means they're organic, they're free roaming, they can lay their eggs outside. That means what else? Uh, that means that, of course, it's organic. That means they're helping to, to save our world by not using insecticides, by not using herbicides. And so uh, perhaps someday we're going to see this. Um, we might also say this is a little bit like foo-foo dust, but this might be the next thing that hits us. So a person who has food has many problems, but a person without food has only one, only one problem. And so I saw this picture out of, a, out of a swine magazine out of Europe, and I still haven't figured out why they're doing this, but I guess, uh, do we do that with our children here? Uh, show them how uh, our animals are butchered? No. But I've got to admit, if you go back to China, and if you go back to the 1950s, there was people that were starving in China. And so what am I thinking now about China? Well, if the U.S puts on tariffs, uh, or if, pardon me, if there's tariffs, if the Chinese put on tariffs from U.S. pork, Canada will sell more pork to China. <laughs> so, maybe the veterinarian's perspective and the farmer's perspective is very, is very close, and obviously it is. We take care of our animals, that's animal welfare, that's his human safety, aha! That's reducing antibiotics. That's the big thing. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And protecting the environment? Ah, yes. How can the veterinarian protect the environment? Well, by advising the farmers on how they ventilate their barn so we don't have methane and that much ammonia and hydrogen sulfide coming out of the barns. That is simple management, and we're going to talk about that today. And of course, the two are one. One is one health. The other is the sweet spot. So today's production is all about the A's. And that's what we're going we're to cover. We're going to cover the A's. Now you've got to remember, when you're reducing antimicrobial usage, your animal welfare could be at balance. But we've got the ability as farmers and as veterinarians to make that balance so that there won't be any animal welfare concerns. We've got that ability, and we can do that right now. So it is not a big deal to grow birds without antibiotics. And when I think of uh, the meetings that I've gone to in the past, I guess what I'm thinking is this. Uh, it started back in 1998 on antimicrobial resistance, and it was just managing. And then in 2005, the road to prudent use. Hey, that's the veterinarian. That's the farmer. They better do it right. And then, for darn sure, stewardship. That means everybody's involved in the pipeline. And then, in 2018, now it's law. This is government. Uh, medically important antibiotics can only be sold by prescription. That's where we're at today. But we started slowly. But uh, the key points are there. Why is antibiotic reduction needed now? Well, this has been mentioned at the annual meeting of Chicken Farmers of Ontario a week ago. 
and its superbugs in 2050 will kill more people than what cancer will if we don't do something about it now. And that's all of our responsibilities. So what's the future? Uh, by the end of 2018, all Category 2 antibiotics critical for human treatment will be under prescription and only, only available for treatment, not for prevention. Category 3 will follow in 2019 to 2020. So we're talking about One Health, reducing the environmental footprint uh, through better feed conversions, better egg production, and, and better growth. And the pollutants from animal agriculture could be significant, but we have to reduce those. And we've got to consider welfare along the way. And the two are not necessarily compatible, but we're getting better at it. We're managing our free roaming egg operations, our aviary systems much better than what we did in the past. But redu uh, protecting human health is our role as a veterinarian. And we got to admit that the risk of disease is higher when poultry is growing in high densities, like that big layer operation in Ohio with a few million birds on the same farm. And But we need a way to treat effectively in the face of a disease outbreak, obviously. Um, we have to balance the, the welfare with the need. And, but food safety and quality is imperative. And now we have in place HACCP plans, hazard analysis, critical control points. Now, producers need a health plan. CFO in their animal care program are recommending that veterinarians and producers have a health plan. And in the health plan, you talk about biosecurity, you talk about how you brood your birds, how you vaccinate your birds, what your condemnation is like. Drug usage is equal to one or accurate diagnosis. That is the veterinarian. You have to diagnose the disease plus one over management. That's the farmer that manages. But we can work together so that we are able to manage. So what would be a, a, an action plan for producers? Get a diagnosis. Cull birds rigorously for the first week. Consider medicating if mortality persists after day seven. Treatment options should be based on sensitivities. Have a sensitivity first and then decide and buy for a bit of time. Because if a bird becomes infected onto your farm, and you know what farmers say? Garbage in is garbage out. Doc, I need a prescription. Garbage in is garbage out. I hear that a hundred times a year. Always medicate with the optimum dose for the optimum period of time. And so what we're talking about is get this done, uh, get a post-mortem. Um, to arrive at a diagnosis, you need to ask questions. You have to get answers. Uh, one of our children took a Dale Carnegie course. They paid $2,000. And guess what they got out of that course? Ask questions, get answers. That is the Dale Carnegie course for $2,000. You don't always find the answer by doing a postmortem. Case history and feed conversions, mortality condemns, improve your problem solving and diagnosis. And so, to arrive at a diagnosis, you need to tune in to what the farmer is telling you about the case. I know when I was behind a cow taking her temperature, talking to the farmer and looking around and see that the cow was struggling a bit at the water bowl. The water bowl was not working. Okay, it can happen, it can happen. But you do need to tune in to farmers and history is really important. I was at a meeting in China, in Beijing, and I heard this is the only thing I remember from that meeting. More diagnoses are missed for not looking and for not knowing. Dr. Blood, bovine veterinary medicine, it's bovine medicine, whatever, it was a long time ago. But that's very important. More is missed for not looking than for not knowing. So they need to be epidemiologists, a wag, a wild ass guess. Well, right now, the way the system works is uh, a lot of farmers in the past, they've had medications. And, you know, when you look at a medication, it's a broad spectrum antibiotic and it's good for enteritis. It's good for synovitis. It's good for erysaculitis. It's good for everything. So it's shotgun. That's shotgun medicine. That's gone. Now, we have not a wag, but we got a swag. It's a scientific-based wild-ass guess. And this is a bit of a problem for me because now the farmers are Googling uh, diseases. 
And so now they become swaggy. Okay, before they were just wags, now they're swags. The evolution of the broiler industry is very interesting. Veterinarians play a role in the evolution of the broiler industry, and there were some tremendous milestones. But to make a long story short, uh, you see, back in 1950, uh, it took well over 100 days to get a two kilo bird. And now we can get that in about, in about 32 days. 31, 32 days, we can get a two kilo bird. But all along that, all along, sorry about that, all along the way, uh, we, have, we had problems. And they were all solved. Veterinarians had a big role in that, but so did farmers, and so did equipment. And so that's how the broiler industry evolved, and we got better at what we were doing. Now, um, I you should never be late for a meeting under two occasions. One is, if you have the first seat in the church, you never want to be late for the sermon. The other occasion is, if you're uh, coming to a meeting of nutritionists, and there's only one chair uh, open there, and it's in the front row, and as I'm walking in, Dr. Leeson I said, Lloyd, you know, you only represent 2% of the improvement in, in, in the last 25 years. And I, I didn't know what to say. Don't be late for the meeting is what to say. And so I thought about it. And then I thought, oh, it's got to come. Okay, there we are. There we are. Oh, there it is. Oh, in reality, the human factor hasn't changed. The difference in performance between farms is really management. But it's genetics. If you follow that evolution of the broader industry, strong genetic component there. Ah, higher growth rates? Yes. 40% better growth rates, 40% more water consumption, 40% more water to take out of your barn. If all the water in a broiler flock were in that barn, you would have eight inches of water. Sorry, I can't think of metric. There's eight inches of water in that barn. You've got to exhaust it. And there's the evolution from 1985 to Weber in 2018, and that is real. Growth rates lead to higher water consumption rates. So today we're talking about healthy gut, the importance of gut health and antibiotic-free production. Ah, if we're a farmer, we're also talking about a healthy soil. That's all I hear. You pick up Country Guide or Ontario Farmer or whatever, or Better Farming, it's all about healthy soil, and it's about crop scouting, crop scouting, so we know what weeds we have, and to know which herbicides to use, and which fungicides, if you have aphids in your soybeans. And so crop scouting is important. Well, it's the same thing in a barn. Uh, we're crop scouting, uh, I believe. That's a good term. It's all about big data. Everything now is about data. Um, uh, how we handle the data, how we react to it. Uh, it's about weight, feed conversion, condemnation, egg production, and of course, crop yield. And so uh, when I attend the Farm Smart Conference, uh, kind of a similarity to the farm, sorry, crops, and, and your in barn management. Environment times management times genetics is equal to yield. And uh, that is very true. So what's the factors affecting broiler performance? or any performance. Breeder health is important. Hatchery management is important. Flock management, air, water quality, lighting, litter. There's a little phrase we use called flaws. Feed, light, air, water, space, sanitation. Ah, and so uh, garbage in, garbage out. That's what I hear from broiler growers, and they say, I want a new hatchery. I want good quality chicks. Um, Anyway, so what is a quality chick? Well, it's well hydrated, it's newly hatched, it's aggressive, and they want them as uniform as peas in a pod. Well, those birds up there at 11 o'clock, they're not as uniform as peas in a pod, and that's because we mix breeder ages. Like, they could be anywhere from 30 to 60. Uh, they could be 27 weeks, so there's multiple ages. Uneven birds, mixed breeder flock, poor start, real virus, real virus. Yeah, birds don't grow, the gut virus. We have astroviruses, and they don't grow well. And so we get on uniform birds. And if you don't cull those birds, the catchers are left, and the poor birds are left behind. 
They have an innate ability, the catchers, that when it's dark in the barn, they can tell a good bird from a bad bird. And so we do need criteria as to how many birds uh, should be left behind. And so there was a survey by a reporter at the, uh, at the poultry show. And what are the concerns? And 99 out of 100 said it's early bacterial infection. And so Better Farming picked this up. And they say vets are optimistic that yolk sac infe infections will continue to decrease. And oh, there's a few people you know there. Okay, so it's bacterial pathogens. All birds, there's no such animal as a sterile day old bird. They're not sterile. So when they're hatched, they're exposed to bacteria. It all depends on how many and how much stress as to whether the birds live or die. So why would you medicate if you have uh, early mortality in day one and two? Those birds are affected, uh, they will die, and you'll pick them up. Wait, just wait. You don't have to medicate them on day three or four. And certainly E. coli is on the radar, and if you get some infections early, they could carry on till two weeks of age. I get very concerned about E. coli, uh, coli bacillosis at about two weeks of age. I get very concerned if it's still there, and then I really say, hey, it's time to do something. And so, yeah, um, this is a, a situation where uh, you want clean eggs coming from the breeder, breeder flock. You want them going into the setters. And so I want to point out here, uh, this is old technology. This is old technology. Three ages of eggs in the setter. New technology, I'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but that's old technology. New hatchery ideas, ah. Um, there's a new hatchery opened up here in Ontario, and they're going to be fed in the hatchery. And where they hatch, the birds, as soon as they hatch, they will drop down. They will drop down, and you're gone from that, where the bacteria are. And they'll drop down, and they'll have feed and water. And that little chick won't weigh 45 grams. That little chick could weigh, when it gets to the farm in two days' time, it could be 70 or 80 grams. It had a good start. And so what they do is uh, the progress per, uh, points with hatch care, uh, yeah, separate um, um, the, the hatch chick from the rest. Um, uh, certainly, <laughs> you need feed right away. You need feed right away. You don't want them to dehydrate. Um, if they are hatched for 36 hours, they will dehydrate. Uh, dehydration is always a concern. Now, it's really all about management. I want to show you the worst, okay? There is some good. There's a lot of things wrong in this, in this picture. And um, uh, I guess um, I've been in this barn multiple times. Every time I go in there, there's a massive feed spill uh, because they never got the triggers fixed. I don't know why. I just don't know why. Uh, the birds are a little chilly. Uh, those birds there would have to take a, just a running jump to hit the drinker. Uh, okay, that's the worst. They're not all like that. Now, that's one in a thousand. But today's management challenges, remove moisture. Dr. Mike Sarek and Dr. Brian Fairchild from the University of Georgia say this. Removing moisture is the most important thing that you should do in any chicken poultry barn, period. But you also want to remove dust. You also want to remove ammonia. And so, uh, Dr. Bill Van Heist, uh, there was a meeting put on over here, uh, science in the pub, sounds good, you have a beer, you listen, and you stay awake, and uh, uh, this scared the hell out of me, but why did it scare the hell out of me? Okay, will this really happen? Uh, ammonia and hydrogen and sulfide, you can't have any more than 100 pounds coming out of your barn. It depends on the size of the barn, maybe. Uh, will that become law? Yeah, EPA scares me, but we have to think about that. And so uh, Dr. Van Heest and grad students have done extensive studies of poultry barns, and, uh, and uh, they do find ammonia. They do find respiratable dust. They find respiratable dust, uh, three micron dust particles, not good. Uh, they, do, they can find some methane, they can find from hydrogen sulfide, and there's always ammonia there. But hopefully keep it down. And the new animal care program, um, the, the people that come around have a little um, ammonia detector. And, um, and it goes beep, beep, beep. It scares the hell out of you. 
okay? Because that means you're over 25 ppm. And if you're over 25 ppm, uh, that means you better not be there because that is an animal welfare concern. And you better use some heat rather than the body heat of the birds to keep the fans going. And so I went into uh, um, an, a barn. This was an organic barn. And um, to keep the pollutants that come out of that end of that radiant tube heater, uh, to keep the pollutants from going into your barn, there used to be an elbow to take it out of the barn. But that producer says, I can't get enough humidity in early to make my coxie vaccine work. So he just cut the pipe. And think about this. Think about this. For every gallon, sorry, I can't think metric or a liter, three quarters of a gallon or a liter is water coming out of there. And that adds moisture to your pen. And so that's what we need to think about. And so it's not just about oxygen, it's also about uh, CO2. We have CO2 meters. And um, the, the old recommendation is 3,500 ppm. Uh, the new recommendations are up to about, well, 5,000 is still okay, but you better be cognizant of that. Uh, relative humidity there, the percent is very low. Uh, yeah, uh, this is where I need it, fresh air. Uh, but that cost, that's propane, that's propane. And of course, when you think about it, um, moisture removal is very important. Uh, every winter I see a lot of ascites, and Dr. Julian has worked on ascites, and that's of multiple causes. Ventilation is important, genetics is important, how you manage your barn is extremely important, have it warm when the birds arrive, and that's, uh, that's very, very important. And so, the gut of the bird is the fastest growing organ in the bird. And so the sooner you get feed in it, and a good way to tell is, you know, fill the crop, pick the bird up, and you should have 90% should have feed in the crop within 12 hours. Uh, you put 50 grams out on paper, and plus what's on the feeders, in the feeders, and you're up to about 80 grams, and you want that feed there because that bird is set to go. And that's, a, that's necessary for health. The gut of the bird is necessary for health. So getting a good start, we put paper out. Uh, we put paper out. We have water available. Uh, yeah, you can't manage what you don't measure. To me, an automatic weigh scale in the barn is the most critical part of your equipment because it tells you the day the birds came in, you can almost predict when they're going to be ready for slaughter. And also, you want to know what the birds weigh on day seven, because that is also the bird needs to go four times its body weight on day seven from day zero, which is the day it comes in. So environmental management, even I can fix this heater. OK, <laughs> that's an embarrassment that that kind of heater didn't work. But you know, so what do birds do? Well, I'm cold. I'm a few days old. Uh, all, anybody can fix that heater. You got a, there's a little igniter in there. And if that doesn't work, it's the, it's the air switch. Yeah, you don't need to pay $350 for a mechanic to come to your farm. Uh, you can get a veterinarian for less. <laughs> okay, brooding temperatures. Okay, uh, sorry, this picture is, oh, this should be banned. This, this picture here is 38 years old. Uh, back uh, a long time ago, um, we had hot water heat in our barns. We had hot water fin pipes. And of course, we thought if we exceeded about 85 degrees, we were going to hurt our birds. Their normal body temperature is 40. But really now, when we brood birds, we have about 34 Celsius, about a foot off the floor. And we know that it's very important to keep that uh, body warm. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot about one thing here. Um, um, dogs are now banned. <laughs> sorry, right there. <laughs> uh, I got another story about that slide. We had a person with a feed company that bronchitis vaccinated birds. And he went from farm to farm to farm. I won't mention his name, did a good job. And all of those birds got sick within five days after he vaccinated them because they were too cold, because we gave them bronchitis vaccine. They got sick. 
that's where the veterinarian came in. But that's, that's the way it used to be. Now we vaccinate in the hatchery. So, a new idea, old idea. So, I go to new barns. Well, back in 35 years ago, if you didn't have hot water heat in your barn, you were considered eh, just an average grower. You can't afford anything better. But now we got the new idea is really an old idea. You see those heaters. And for $2.40 a square foot, we can have hot water heat in the barn. Why is that important? Because with hot water heat, we're not exhausting all that moisture and that carbon monoxide and that carbon dioxide. We can ventilate less. All right, but you better balance it. We can ventilate less. Litter management. Um, I've never been in a broader barn where I ever see the nipple drinkers are at the right height. They're never right. And you know what the growers call me? It's called cable stretch. Cable stretch. And this is what they say. Our barns, if they're 400, 500, 600 feet long, they, you know, they put the brand new equipment in. And then over time, there's cable stretch. And the first 50 feet, the nipple drinker's too low. And then at the very center, it's too high. And so they don't adjust it. Oh, then the other thing they tell me is, well, whoever blew the straw in, they didn't make it very uniform. They just didn't make it uniform. That's the problem. That's why it's not at the right height. But there's a serious problem here. And the serious problem is, I was on an organic broiler farm a week ago, and um, th this was a serious problem. We measured the amount of water. It's called the lot system. You can Google this in the University of Arkansas. And the lot system is measuring the amount of water that should come out of a nipple in one minute. And according to the formula, the formula is this, 20 plus seven times the week of age, which if they were three weeks of old, that's 20 and 21, that's 40. Well, lo and behold, his birds were three weeks old and he was getting 90 ml of water. And of course, his barn was wet. It was wet for about two feet in each side of the nipple drinker. And of course, you know, he wasn't happy about that. And so I wrote him a nice letter, and I sent him that information, and I told him that, um, well, either your nipple drinkers are worn out, or there's too much calcium, or you don't have the right pressure. And um, so we looked at all that. And so we looked at that. And so I guess I'm looking at that. And uh, well, geez, I, I don't know. There's a little ball in there. Well, that's a new one I, that was put in. And you could actually see the ball. But if it's, uh, when it's covered with that bunch of gunk, I, then they, they bring out their, their, their cell phone and they shine a light in it to see where the ball is because they never adjusted it. And so it's all about uh, regulation. I tell producers uh, when they have their nipple drinkers too low, did you ever try and drink a bottle of beer without putting it up like this? And so I get their attention. Uh, so it, they have to be always right. It's called, uh, it's called management, it's called management. And so I did a calculation, I guess I'd call it a wag, that's a wild ass guess, but I, it might actually be accurate. I predicted in that barn that you just saw that the nipple drinker got hit a million times. If you got hit that often, you'd be worn out too. So, so really, nipple drinkers wear out, and so you gotta replace them, you gotta replace them. And so why? Well, we don't want wet litter. That's not a nice picture to show. Birds still look clean, but that litter is caked right over. It's, uh, it's wet. So uh, we're going to hit that again because we have some, some important things to talk about. Okay, I attended the, um, the Farm Smart conference, and lo and behold, Dr. Temple Grandin was there. And uh, get out of your silo, tell your story, be transparent. That's what the poultry industry is doing now. Uh, very strong input by the egg industry. And the other industries, too, uh, are doing this uh, to try and get the farmer message out there. And you have Farm Smart magazines. You can go online. You can see how things should be done and how we're really doing it. And so if you were a broiler grower in Denmark or in Germany or in, in Holland, animal welfare is the number one way they judge your barn. Uh, animal welfare? Oh, the foot pads. The foot pads. They, uh, if they're all caked and cracked and there's foot pad dermatitis, you've got a dirty barn. You don't manage your barn well. Catching and loading. Ah, yes. Okay, this is the way we used to do it. We're going to talk about how we're doing it now or in the future. You corral the birds along the wall. You get them really tight. 
really tight, really tight, not too tight, right near the door so you don't have to walk too far. And then you pick them up and you pick up three in one hand and four in the other and you hand it to another guy and he picks them up and he's on top of the, the, the crates and hopefully he won't fall off. And then you try and get all those chickens through a hole that's about 10 inches by 12. Um, and it's a little bit of a challenge. And so that's why we're going to modular loading. There's drawers in there. You pull them out uh, and you can put the birds in. And you put the drawers and the modules where the birds are. So you're not walking and handing. And so that's a, a significant animal welfare advancement. Animal welfare. I'm not going to talk much about layers. Um, I'm, anyway, but I thought I'd throw this in. Um, <laughs> the only difference between these two groups of birds, uh, they were in identical barns. Identical barns, Avery system. Those birds didn't have any feathers. Whatsoever. They were also organic. I see that. Organic birds sometimes. That's a challenge. Uh, one barn had good feathers, no problems. The other barn had serious problems with feather pecking and cannibalism. Um, that's genetics, that's management, that's many, many things. And so feather pecking is always a consideration. Uh, one of the things I want to point out right here is, ah, cellulitis, scratching, walk very carefully through the birds. Very carefully through the birds, very carefully through the birds as the age. And of course, uh, cannibalism in turkeys. I see a lot less of this now than I did years ago because genetically they've done something. They've done something genetically. Free range is gone. Ah, another A, avian influenza. I used to uh, have turkeys out on range and the seagulls came. And Dr. Bruce Hunter tapped me on the shoulder one day and this was out near Lake Bellwood. And he says, Lloyd, uh, by the way, did you know that we found some Newcastle and some avian influenza there? And these seagulls, they went for a swim on Lake Bellwood. Uh, they went to the local garbage dump for entertainment, and they came to our place to eat. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so it's great. When the sun shines, it's great. Um, yeah, ah, avian influenza. Okay, that was a fear. Uh, we learned from Pennsylvania in uh, 1985 that one gram of AI positive manure from AI positive has enough virus in it to kill a million birds. Now if that doesn't scare the hell out of you, it should. Because that's why we do get, uh, we do get concerned. Ah, yes, I threw this in. You might say, hey, that's a fake picture. Um, um, where I come from, raccoons climb ladders. And if you think I, uh, I, I really put that on and it really didn't happen, uh, you're, you're wrong. Uh, raccoons can lift latches, they can climb ladders, and my farm manager says one day, I met a raccoon coming down when I was going up. <laughs> he said the raccoon turned around, but he says I did too. <laughs> okay, artificial intelligence. I have producers now that can, on their smartphone, they can be in Florida, <laughs> and they can see what's going on in their barn. And guess what the names are uh, of these? The genius system, uh, the maximus, the expert system. Well, that's artificial intelligence, but um, earn your MBA. Well, I have four kids that have masters in business administration. I'm working on mine, but mine is management by being around. And that is what all producers need to do is managed by being around. You still have to sense what's going on in your barn. Uh, yeah, so let's hit some challenges. How's my time doing? We've got 12 more minutes. Okay, we gotta move. Okay, yeah, we talked about uh, ventilation. Ah, here, here's the important. Necrotic enteritis, antibiotic free production. The fear of the Lord goes into people when they raise ABF birds. They might get necrotic. What am I gonna do? Oh, well, the old idea was I spoke at a meeting one time and it says, well, there was a, a typo. It wasn't necrotic, it was neurotic enteritis. And broader producers get neurotic about necrotic. And it's not a big deal. Dr. Martine Bouillon in Quebec did a study where she compared uh, traditional flocks with ABF flocks. And actually, uh, the weights were fairly close. Uh, the feed conversion was higher on a drug-free flock. 
uh, for higher feed conversion ratio, 184 versus 178, uh, condemns were about the same. And so, what's the economic importance of coxy and necrotic enteritis? Well, it's a little bit like uh, an iceberg. All necrotic enteritis is caused by coxy. You can quote me on that. All necrotic enteritis is related to coxiosis challenge. And we coxy vaccinate birds, and we don't always do it right. And so we do oocyst counts. We do oocyst counts every week to see what the oocyst, and we have two different vaccines here. One is comes in early uh, with fairly high numbers, and then it goes off lower. And maybe that's a good thing, because here you want a lower number. And so uh, basically, what, do, uh, what, what is important about OSS counts? Well, if you have low density chickens, that's a beautiful picture. It's very low density. It's not like that picture from Holland. Uh, those birds can romp and they can, they're, all of our broiler chickens are free roaming. And so why are my, are my birds vaccinated properly? So they look to see if they've got some green on them. And then they look at the papers. I had some come in yesterday. And you look at the birds. There they got Coxivac B52. Gee, they didn't all get it. Well, yeah, maybe not. And so they question. That's where they're at. They just question. And so necrotic enteritis, um, if they go a bit green on the rear end, um, uh, my growers can Google anything now. Uh, but it's uh, I, uh, necrotic enteritis in broader chickens, I tell, is medium to fine sandpaper Canadian tire. That's what it looks like. It actually does. Uh, Canadian rules around uh, no antibiotic ever. Uh, yes, vaccine. Yes, yes, yes. Only in Canada. <laughs> we can't use any ionophores. We can't use any chemicals. We can only use vaccine. The USA and Europe, ah, in Europe they can do almost anything. Um, uh, litter management is important. We hit that. Be prepared for wet litter when you have ABF birds because of the gut damage. You start out and those birds are about 10 days old, it's still dry, it's still dry, and when you kick it apart, oh, there's some dry straw underneath. But by the time the birds are about three weeks old, it has caked over. It has caked over, that's normal. With, on an ABF ration, it's all soybeans. It's no meat meal, more potassium, and so that's the problem. So an adequate quantity of finely chopped straw, you gotta put more in, you gotta do it right, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, so, uh, water consumption, yes, it's higher with uh, ABF. And the alternate diets, uh, yeah, no meat meal. That's what people want. They want an all vegetable diet in their birds. And with that, you get flushing, and you get wetness, and then you get pollution. And, oh, light management. This is very different. We have found very successfully when our broilers are Seven days old, we reduced the light intensity from 100% down to 20. By day 12, we're down to 10. Guess what? You might say, well, it looks kind of nice in there. How do I know it's really that dark in that barn and those birds are really light? I can see some light coming into the chimneys and from those air inlets along the side. But um, why might that be important? Maybe when it's dark, they don't reflect and see the fecal material, so they're not picking. Prevent litter picking. Less oasis coming in, less coxy, less necrotic. So light is very important, and of course ventilation is very important. Uh, there you can see a barn all laid out. Uh, conditions are, are, are beautiful. Um, you drop the birds right in the center of the barn. You don't put them underneath the heaters because you'll overheat the suckers. And if you overheat them, you can cause them splay lake. Um, when the birds are day five to ten, we can add more moisture. You can have a sprinkler, a mister, or you can backpack and spray over the feed to make sure the oasis germinate. So, brand new barn, gorgeous facility, in-floor heating. Oh, that's a challenge. Uh, they all at the one end, they're all at the one end for about ten days to pick up the oasis for cycling, and then you give them the full, full barn after that. Um, that's what they recommend. We acidify the water. I have uh, producers that uh, figure out that their pH uh, regulator is correct, and uh, they figure it out. Um, they figure it out, and um, you know what they use as their uh, how to know that it's really right? A can of Coca-Cola, pH of 2.8. And so I tell the farmers, if you go to Mexico 
and you eat some bad food and whatever, uh, <laughs> you better drink Coca-Cola. Anyway, we acidify the water. I don't know. It is very beneficial. That's all I can say. And so, yep, uh, you, we, do, we do ORP readings, uh, we do chlorine readings, uh, iron clog filters, oh, garbage, 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 you got to change your filters. There's iron in wells. Yeah, there's iron, there's iron, there's lots of iron. Uh, so there we're, we've gone to chlorine dioxide as opposed to hypochlorous acid, um, and it seems to work. Why do we disinfect water? Well, if you're a broiler grower, you can get a nipple with a saucer or without. We elect to go with the saucers, but my God, they're dirty. Uh, they're filthy. You better have good chlorine level in that water because they want to drink from there. And if you have a baby bird coming in and drinking from that, you say, oh, that's not very good. Uh, would you like to drink your water from the same cup for, um, for two months? I'm not sure. Uh, beetles. Um, we'll hurry along here. Beetles, they carry over bacteria and viruses. This to me is a tremendous challenge. Darkling beetles and hairy fungus beetles, they live in cracks and the farmers say, I don't have any, I don't have any. Well, that's because they're not looking until they get so many that they're underneath the feeders, they crawl the walls, and if you have, uh, if you have any beetles in your barn, uh, well, there's uh, little chicks, my gosh, little chicks are even eating the beetles right there. Um, ah, I got that. Actually, that was true. Uh, that was, that's not a fake picture. Um, but anyway, um, and so, uh, oh yeah, I don't know. We'll have time for that. But anyway, for darkling beetles, um, you, have to, you have to use an insecticide on your walls and on the cracks. And we're, even in brand new barns where the floor meets wall, there's a crack that wide. A half an inch crack and the beetles go down and as soon as the catchers leave and the heat of the birds leaves, uh, everything is tickety-boom, uh, but the beetles have moved. And at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in the morning, you had better be spraying the walls at 4 a.m. You better not be in bed, you better be spraying the walls because if you don't spray then, the beetles will have gone down into the cracks and you're too late. You blew it. You blew it. Um, to me, that's a big challenge. How's the time? You got five minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, we won't go on. It's more of the same. Uh, uh, there is one picture I really wanted to show you, and let's see if I can get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, right. here it is. I want to leave you this one picture. Ah, uh, I have more to talk about, but some other time. Bronchitis is everywhere. Variant strain, Delmarva strain. And I look at that and I say, how does bronchitis, it's a coronavirus, it's like the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, and it can be carried, and it can survive, and the titer can go down, and it can infect the next lot. Even though you, quote, clean the manure out, it's still there. But what do we see? What do we see there? We see a truck. Oh, that's a, that's a feed truck there. My gosh. Uh, we're blowing uh, the air out of that barn. Uh, the catchers are there. Uh, he's sucking that feed up. Uh, but those catchers, if you think those vans are clean, guess again. They can't be sterile. So I'll leave you that thought if there's any questions. Um, I had more to talk about, but we won't worry about it. It's not important. Thank you very much, Lloyd. I know that uh, there are lots of questions. Uh, He's got a few more minutes after the talk, and uh, if you'd like, you can come over and have a chat with Dr. Lieber. And I also forgot to, to mention that, uh, first of all, we are very thankful to Kevin Hawk, who's uh, our videographer, and uh, we are being live streamed at the moment. So without further ado, if there are some questions for Dr. Lieber, some burning questions, please go ahead. So how do we stop that? Because I'm, I'm coming from the hog industry with that would be a no-no. Right. In the poultry, which they say, yeah. you're screwed. I wish I had an answer on that. Yeah. Um, viruses and bacteria move on wheels. <laughs> and that's the problem. Um, yeah. It's, it is a problem. I'm, how do you stop that? Um, oh, I know. You go to... Um, you go to uh, a place where you can buy very cheap, very, very cheap uh, running shoes or boots. And you supply running shoes or boots for all of the catchers. But 
be careful because they all go back into their truck for a smoke and for some whatever. And uh, yeah, that's what I know some people, they go to Walmart. They tell me Walmart has the cheapest running shoes you can buy. And so they have running shoes, but they're never the right size. But anyway, so that would be a way. Uh, you walk, remember bronchitis virus and coronaviruses and epidemic diarrhea, I love it. Um, carried on the bottom of the foot. You think of bronchitis, okay, yeah, okay, but it's in the gut. It's in the gut of the bird and that's where it shed. Yeah. Yes? Oh yeah, disposable boots and coveralls. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I got it, okay. What about disposable boots and coveralls? Um, disposable boots and coveralls aren't worth a pinch of kunshia. <laughs> I, I don't mean to put it in a negative, but the disposable boots are worn out within an hour. Uh, the coveralls, if they're, if they're good quality coveralls, like I see students and OBC uh, profs, they wear coveralls that aren't throwaway. Uh, if they're clean, wonderful idea, wonderful idea. But uh, disposable boots, uh, not that great, sorry. <laughs> Yes. Ammonia and CO2 ventilation. Yes. If you're running a lot of these new ones, maxes and stuff, run CO2 probes, yeah. will ammonia look after itself? Yeah. Look after everything else or water? Which one should you balance on? Not okay. Not humidity, but your body uh, can also do CO2. Yeah. Um, think of CO2, relative humidity, and all of the factors that you're monitoring in your barn. Um, when I think of that, um, the most important is relative humidity. The CO2, not as important. I don't like to be over 5,000. That's the new norm now. The chicken farmers of Ontario are wrong. They have 3,500. It's been upgraded to five. That's very good. And if Mike Sarg says it's good, it's good. Um, uh, you don't want to be eight or 10,000. Uh, and so some farmers start their birds. They don't turn any fans on. And all of those carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and all that moisture comes out of those heaters that exhaust into the barn. And so that's Relative humidity, you never, ever want to be over 70%. Never, ever. Yeah. Maggie. Yeah. Uh, last question is going to go to Maggie. Sure. Good. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned about the effect of genetic on growth, effect of genetic on behavior, but you didn't mention much about the effect of genetic on health and disease resistance. Do you see any bad barriers on that, the going to industry, picking up our industry, or? I have mental left here. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is about uh, uh, the impact of genetics. Okay, on sorry, I got it, I got it, yes. I got it, okay. <laughs> Don't mind me, uh, I didn't sleep well last night. Uh, uh, genetics is extremely important uh, on egg layers and on behavior. It's important for turkeys. And genetics are somewhat uh, very important also in the, in the broader meat production. Um, I, tremendous, tremendous progress was made on reducing heart attacks, uh, reducing ascites with genetics in broilers. And I see uh, in the layers, the feather, the feather coat is really important. And whether a bird wants to genetically pick feathers, you can, you can, you can select for that. And if you don't have good feathers, you're not gonna have good production. And so, it is very important, very and, important. And, and, and on health? And, food, like and on health, right, and on health? Dairy cattle on genetics. Excellent, yes. And on, on the health of the bird, right. Genetics and health is also, <laughs> there's a little rumor going around that there's two major breeds of broaders out there now. And the one has a better immune system than the other. Okay, yeah, you can, and, and they are doing this now, where they don't just have birds in isolation and breeding, they actually uh, bring birds into a stressful situation and see how they perform. And that is a good thing. Yeah, genetics is really important, and we should not knock genetics and what the improvement we've made. So if anybody tells you that, uh, the birds are growing too fast and you want a slow growing bird? Eh, I don't know, I don't think so. Well, I know that there, there are probably more questions, but uh, 
we need to close the session. Uh, thank you very much, Lloyd, again for the wonderful presentation. Very exciting, very enthusiastic, and uh, it's been most wonderful. So uh, please join me to thank Dr. Bieber for his wonderful presentation.